Good morning, Crow River Church. Happy Sunday. Thank you so much for tuning in online with us today. We're going to start off this morning with a new song that declares that fear has no hold on us because we are standing in the love of Jesus. So wherever you are, would you please stand or find a worshipful posture and sing with us this morning. Darkness tries to roll over my bones. Sorrow comes to steal the joy back. Brokenness and pain is all I know. I won't be shaken. I won't be shaken. My fear doesn't stand a chance when I.
Hey, good morning, Crow River Church. Thank you for tuning in. I'm Aaron Sorensen. I'm the pastor, and thankful that you are with us this morning. You know, we, um, we filmed these services earlier in the week, and uh, last Sunday, if it were a typical Sunday where, we're, we were, where we were meeting, you know, when things happen in our world that week um, that we feel like we need to pray about, talk about, uh, we address it. Um, obviously, there's things going on in our backyard. There's things um, happening in our world where we're seeing a lot of pain, a lot of suffering, um, a lot of wounds. And last Sunday, it wasn't, uh, it wasn't that we weren't addressing or want praying or wanting to, to, to do anything, but that we recorded this earlier. And so this week, I wanted to make sure just to say something um, as I, like many of you, have been processing through um, what we've seen going on and um, been able to have some good conversations with my wife, friends, our staff, and um, one of the things that's been challenging for me is just this question of like, how do we, how do we respond? How do I respond? And um, looking at the pain, looking at um, injustice, looking at the divisions that we see in our world, I get like super overwhelmed, like super quick. And the problems are not easy problems to solve. They're complex. They're deep. Like there's deep rootedness in, in um, the the suffering that we're seeing, the pain that we're seeing, the sin that we're seeing. And uh, as I think and pray about it, I just get super overwhelmed. I'm like, God, what do we do? Like, what do I do? You know, what does it look like to pastor through this? Like all these, these challenging and difficult um, questions. And I as, I, as I was talking about it with the staff and, and as I was praying about it, I just felt like God um, in, said something in the midst uh, of a difficult, challenging, complex situation that I just want to share with you if it's okay. Um, how do I respond to sort of the, the sinking feeling that the problems and the pain and the suffering that I see in the world is, is too big to tackle and, and too complex for um, answers or too complex for me, just me, to respond to? And um, I'm not going to pretend like I know a lot about uh, what's going on, or that I'm, I'm, um, um, you know, an expert in these areas, but I felt like God said to me, you know, when you look at the complexity of the problems and the suffering um, and the divisions in, in our world between people and, and, and race and um, the complexities around it, um, what what if the answer is, is, is fairly simple um, and straightforward, 
yet really difficult to do. Because I felt like God said that one of, like the answer to the division, the pain, the suffering that we're seeing um, is really the com- like the greatest commandment that God gave us. And that is, what if we, like, what if I chose to love God with my, all my heart? Like, what if I, every day, was surrendering in worship to God, like surrendering to the way of Jesus and, and, and living like Jesus and, and loving God with all my being? And what if I then also loved my neighbor as myself? Very short commandments, uh, very easy to say, um, but super difficult to live out sometimes in this life. And yet, if we did that as the, as the people of God, if, 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 if the world lived by that, those commandments to love God and to love your neighbor, I think we would see healing. Um, I know that there's a lot more complexity and answers to the, all, a lot of the questions of how do we, how do we get healed, but what, maybe that's a place we can start. And it's a place I want to start. Because I can sort of like, it helps me move from the, the, the sinking feeling a, around how complex and I don't know where to go and where to turn. Like, what if I focused, what I can focus on, uh, how I love God and how I love my neighbor? And that means I'm gonna, I'm gonna love my neighbor who I don't really know that well or who maybe I don't like very well. I, I'm gonna love my neighbor who's my, my enemy. I'm gonna love my neighbor who's different than me. I'm gonna love my neighbor who um, looks different than me. I'm gonna love my neighbor who makes more money than me? I mean, all the things that divide us, what if we said, that's my neighbor, regardless, and I'm going to love them? Because we need to remind ourselves that the people that we come into contact with, the people that we uh, see on TV, uh, they are image bearers. And that needs to shape the way that we look at people, the way that we treat people, the, uh, the, the way that we quickly rush to judgment on people. That what if, we, what if we look through the lens of the people that I see, the people that I read about, the people that I come into contact every day, like, yeah, maybe I don't agree with them. Maybe I don't like the way that uh, they're, they're living or responding to things. Maybe they don't have the same views or opinions or beliefs as me. Regardless, they are image bearers, made in the image of God. And I, when I remind myself of that, it allows me to love People that are different than me, people that um, are difficult, people that uh, have hurt me, people who I can't understand that, that they believe what they believe. All the things that can affect the way that uh, I might treat someone or draw conclusions um, because uh, all the differences that I could focus on. What if, what if I focus on, what if we focused first that that person is, is an image bearer of God? That allows us to love our neighbor, our very different neighbors. So I just, I wanted to share that, and I, it's something that, man, if we just, if, if we live that out, I think that's a great starting place for us um, to live it out every day. And I, I, I believe that God would use it to heal and heal our land and heal the divisions and the pain and the suffering that we see um, today and will continue to see. And yet um, the power of, of loving uh, God and loving one another can overwhelm and overcome evil, destruction, hatred, ev- racism, division. So I've, it's all right. Um, let me just pray, and then we'll jump into uh, our teaching this morning. Lord, um, you are capable of 
of healing. Even the most divisive, evil, complex problems that we see. Because Jesus, you're enough. What you, um, what you did on the cross is enough to defeat the, the, the sin that the enemy so desperately wants us to live from, to just defeat the, the evil forces, the unseen evil forces that are at work in this world. That Jesus, you're enough. And I pray, God, that we would be a people that are equipped to constantly surrender our lives, our ambitions, our, 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 our plans, our opinions, our beliefs to you, Jesus. That we would follow in your way, not our way, but, but your way, Jesus. And we're told that the Spirit of God lives in us, those of us who have professed and put our faith in you, Jesus. And that Spirit can allow us to love, to forgive, to, um, to, to show compassion, to serve, to help, to love our neighbor. And so I just pray, God, that we would be people that every day looks and asks, how can we love you today, God, and how can we love our neighbor? Remind us that, that we are image bearers of, of, um, of you, God. And that means that every person has infinite value. That every person we come into contact is, is, is worthy So I just pray that our eyes would be fixed on, on that and less on the things that divide us. In Jesus' name, amen. Uh, this morning, we're starting a, a new series. We, we com finally completed last week uh, the series on the book of Romans. And we're going um, now from the New Testament to the Old Testament. And we're going to look at uh, one of my favorite characters of the Bible, and that is Joseph. We're going to look at the life of Joseph told through uh, the uh, the book of Genesis. I um, have started to tell stories to my son, like when I'm putting my son Jonas to bed, uh, we read books, we kind of, you know, we, we, like many of you who have little kids, uh, we have um, kind of a system in place, like patterns to, to bedtime, and, and one of the things, that we'll read books, and then I get into bed, and right now my son is at a, a, like a daddy stage, like if you ask him, who do you want to do this? Feed you, uh, make you breakfast, put you to bed, it's daddy. Um, who do you want to take you outside? Who do you want to play with? It's, it's, it's daddy. So he's in a daddy phase, which I love. Um, but uh, so I've been putting him to bed uh, a lot lately. And, and so one of the things I started to do is just to kind of like help calm him down. Uh, as he's laying there and we're done reading books, is I'm like, you want me to tell you a story? And he's like, yeah. And so I, I've started to just make up stories on the spot, and they are, they're just terrible stories. They're awful stories. Like, I wish, I wish uh, that I had, like, a memory of some of those, like, classic stories, the like children's stories, but I just don't. And so I just make up stories about, like, most of it's around, like, wildlife um, you know, like characters like birds and, and foxes and bears. And I just start to talk and I was like, hey, here's, here's like, uh, Willie the walrus is, is wakes up one morning. And then I have no idea like where I'm going or what I'm going to say. And they usually just end and they're terrible and they're awful. But my son's kind of like, it puts him to sleep. So I guess it works. But, um, a couple nights ago, uh, one of the books we read before bed is this like great storybook book about Jesus. And, and we're reading it and we go to bed and he's like, tell me a story. That's what he'll say now. Tell me a story. Tell me a really, and what I hear is, tell me a really bad story, dad, that you're making up on the spot. Um, but he goes, tell me a story. And then he goes, tell me a story about Jesus. And, 
like, it was a split second, and in, in that split second, I felt like, wow, like, amazing. I can do that, and like, wow, my son wants to hear about Jesus. But he said it so quick, he goes, tell me a story about Jesus. And he goes, no, wait, tell me a story about Buzz Lightyear. And he like switched. I went from this, this moment of like, complete, wow, my son wants to know about, more about Jesus, to now I better, better move toward Buzz Lightyear. Um, but it was kind of this funny moment. But I, I can assure you that this story, like this is a good story. The story of Joseph is a compelling um, drama with a lot of ups and downs. And there's a lot of things that we can learn from this, this story. It's almost like they should have made a musical out of it or something. But um, one of the things about the story is early on at the beginning of the story, there is a sin, a dark sin, that is can be easily missed. But it's really the rooted um, sin, the rooted problem that, that leads to really the, the dysfunction in this family and the catastrophe that we see uh, played out in this story. So let me read for you Genesis 37, uh, starting in verse 1. It says this, Jacob lived in the land where his father had stayed, the land of Cana. This is the account of Jacob's family line. Joseph, a young man of 17, was tending the flocks with his brothers, the sons of Bilhah and the sons of Ziphlah, his father's wives, and he brought their father a bad report about them. Joseph's a bit uh, of a tattletale. We'll find out because he kind of has some, he, he has a little bit of self-righteousness because we're going to find out um, that he's the favorite. Verse 3, now Israel, meaning Jacob, uh, loved Joseph more than any of his other sons because he had been born to him in his old age and he made an ornate robe for him. When his brothers saw that their father loved him more than any of them, they hated him and could not speak a kind word to him. You know, we've heard, I, I, if you've been in, around like Christian circles for some time, you've heard the story like Joseph, the amazing coat, multicolored, we assume, coat. We know it's ornate, but um, this gift that Jacob gives Joseph, his favorite, uh, his favorite son, and yet we miss, like, the dysfunction. <laughs> that Jacob has a favorite son. The, dif- this, the dif- dysfunction here is, is favoritism. And I don't know about you, but, like, when I read this story, I just, I almost, I almost get, like, stuck on Joseph. Like he, here's the main character. He's the hero. He's the good guy. And then his brothers, I look at, and they're like, they're the enemy. They're the bad guys. Joseph's like the protagonist in the story. His brothers are the antagonists. And almost, it's, it's easier to relate to the hero or want to be the hero in any story than it is to relate to the, the antagonists. Like, we don't picture ourselves there. And yet, uh, we've all been one of the brothers. Like, we've all been on the other side of, of favoritism. You know, all of us have favorites. And we talk about the thi- our favorite stuff. You know, we talk about uh, our favorite food, our favorite restaurants, our favorite sports teams, uh, our favorite cars, our favorite jobs, you know, our, our, our favorite clothes. I mean, the list goes on and on and on. Like, we have favorites. And we like to talk about our favorites. But let me ask those of you who are parents, do you have a favorite kid? Like, when it, when, it, when it comes back to people, like, it's one thing to say, you know, my favorite restaurant is, is whatever, Brickside. And, and if my favorite house is, my favorite restaurant is the, is the King's House, like, that doesn't bother me. You know, if like your favorite restaurant isn't my favorite restaurant. But when you start to move favorites and favoritism into people, it's, it's a lot different. And we do this because like we have best friends. We talk about that. Like we label, oh, this, so-and-so is my best friend. And it's great when you're the best friend, but what about when you're the other friend? 
And, and what we see in, in this story is that favoritism is a, is a dark sin that will bring nothing but destruction, dysfunction, uh, anger into relationships, into families, into friendships, into uh, groups of people, communities, churches. And it's something that we have to be super mindful of. Uh, and, and for some reason, I don't know, Jacob like wasn't mindful of it or he didn't care. I don't know because we see in the, like the story of Jacob that he, he doesn't, he plays favorites. Like it's a habitual sin that, that we see in his life and it starts with his wives. You know, if, if, if you're familiar with the story, Jacob falls in love um, with a woman named Rachel, and he ultimately uh, works for her father to, to, to like win her. Uh, very different time than it is now. And at, that, at the end of that time, he basically gets tricked to, to marry um, Rachel's sister, Leah. And so uh, when he realizes that he's been tricked, and you can go read the story for yourself, it's, in, it's, it's earlier in Genesis, he, he's not sad, I mean, he's upset, he's angry, and he loves Rachel, that's who he wants to, to marry. He works then uh, for Rachel, ultimately marries Rachel. So now he's married to two women who are sisters, and he has an obvious favorite. And we see that, that sadly, Leah live, like, lives a sad, broken life. And she's able to bear children where Rachel isn't. And so they start to have children. And, and Leah's like hope is, okay, if I can give a son, and uh, then, then Jacob's going to show me love. Like he's going to give me affection. And yet he doesn't because Rachel's his favorite. And he gives his love, his attention, his best to her. And Leah just keeps, you know, uh, hoping and praying and having more kids and, and hoping that that'll be enough to, to, to get the love that she so desperately wants from her husband. And yet it, it, it doesn't. But the story, we, we know that, that one day Rachel is, is finally able to get pregnant and she has a son and that son is Joseph. Joseph. And the text tells us that, that he loved Joseph and, he, and Joseph was his favorite, one, because he had Joseph later in his life, but two, it's because it's Rachel's. It's because the woman that he loved most has had this son. And so he holds uh, this son in, in higher esteem. And the story goes on that, that, you know, Joseph is out with his brothers and then he comes back and he's like tattletaling on his brothers. Why? Because Joseph knows that he's his dad's favorite. Like there's, there's, Joseph is a great guy and we're going to see that he's a man of integrity. But early on in his life, he, he uh, there's some self-righteousness here. There's, um, you know, he's, he's leveraging the fact that he's his dad's favorite and he, he, he arrogantly believes that he can just kind of uh, do and say whatever he wants. And, and, and it's not going to help his relationship with his brothers. You know, it's one thing to speak truth to someone, but you do it in the right way. It's another thing to, even if it's truthful, to sort of boastfully tattletale. And he does that with his brothers because he just thinks he can get away with it. And it, it does nothing, I mean, it's going to do nothing but create further division in, in brokenness in his relationships with his brothers. And so Joseph's status is because he's the son of his beloved uh, and departed, uh, the, the beloved and departed wife, Rachel. And jo Jacob, you know, like goes public with this, when he gives 
Joseph the gift of, of the coat. And uh, it's a symbol. It's the symbol that you're my favorite because no one else gets it except for Joseph. And so it's a, it's a reminder to his brothers that their father loves Joseph more than them. I mean, honestly, I bet you it's less about the gift. It's less about, my guess would be that it was less about the, the ornate coat that, that Joseph receives as a gift, and it was more about the special love that the father was giving Joseph. And my guess is that it was more hurtful um, to not receive the love and affirmation from the father than it was to not get a gift. You know, it's great when you're the favorite. It's great when you're the best friend. It's great when you're included. It's great to be Joseph. But how does it feel when you know you're not the best friend? How do, how do you feel when you don't get the gift, when you don't get the affirmation, when you don't get the love, when, you, when you're not included, when you're left out, when you're rejected? How does it feel when you're one of the brothers? You know, I don't, when I think back to just my life, um, some of the most painful things that, have, that I've had to work through and talk through with counselors and talk through with like spiritual mentors and prayed through, for me have been the times where I've experienced rejection from people, where I've been left out. You know, things that you might sort of laugh off as an adult, but that still hurt. You know, I remember like in high school, a bunch of my, my buddies, um, like finding out that, that they, they all went to this concert and they didn't invite me. And you know, you look back and you, even just saying it, you kind of feel like, oh, it's foolish. Not that big of a deal. But when, whenever you feel left out, whenever you, whenever you recognize that you're, you're an outsider. Whenever you, you see others being included and you not being included, like there is, there is a deep feeling that often comes over us and that is of rejection. And regardless of the circumstances that created the rejection, rejection is a powerful force that sticks. I mean, it is sticky. And it might be the, the rejection from friends. It could be the rejection from your father or your mother or um, a family member or a pastor. I mean, the list goes on and on and on. But it's sticky because, man, I can recall with clarity times in my life where I've been rejected. And likely therapists make a living talking and helping people uh, through rejection and the rejection that people have faced throughout their life. I mean, and, and this is true, like, for me even today. And I would say, like, the times that I've been hurt the most as a pastor have not been, like, the critiques. Or, you know, like, the subtle jabs. Or the... Yeah, I don't, I don't think this, like, we're going in the right direction. You need, you know, like, those sorts of things that are in some ways par for the course when you're a pastor. The, th the things that have hurt me the most is when I get treated differently amongst friends, left out, rejected, because I'm a pastor. I had a... Uh, I had somebody who at the grocery store come up to me this last week. This, this was cr crazy. First time this has happened where they go, I was just like, I was looking for um, shore lunch to cook fish. And I'm just, I'm wearing like a cutoff shirt. You see me around D-Town like on a Saturday, I'm going to be wearing shorts and a cutoff shirt in, in the summer. And I'm just there get, looking for shore lunch. And uh, a gal from Crow River comes up to me and goes, oh my word, I've never seen you in the wild. And I turned around and I was like, hey, oh, hey, what's up? She's like, I've never seen you like out. 
and uh, comes up to me and goes, hold on, we, we got to do a selfie, and did a selfie. And I, it was like flattering because it's like, whoa, you know, it's kind of like the closest that I'm ever going to get to celebrity status. It is. Like, I'll never get probably any further. And, you know, I, I, if it, uh, it's affirming. It's kind of cool. Uh, and it was fun to just talk or whatever. And I think it's important to, to, to see like, yeah, your pastor wears shorts sometimes. Your pastor goes grocery shopping. Like, I'm just, I'm, I'm just a guy. I'm pretty normal. Um, but what comes with the position, it's not that easy. I get that. And there's some good things. Like, there's some fun things. Um, but then there's some things that are difficult. That, uh, you know, maybe people don't want you around. Because you're a pastor. And my wife, like, we, it's just, it is part of our life in ministry. And she faces it and goes through it too. And I don't say that to, to sort of throw a pity party, but, but the reality is, is all of us, all of us f- have and, and do face like forms of rejection through, f- through favoritism. And, and this is, this is what, what, what you see, that, that favoritism, uh, all it does is it creates anger. It creates envy and jealousy. And when we consciously or unconsciously favor someone, we, we create envy in other people. I mean, even the people we're close to and, and actually love. Because favoritism, it creates this impression that I, I love or like someone more. It, it, it creates an, uh, an in and out. I'm in, you're out. And it's great when you're Joseph. But we forget, like when you're Joseph, you forget what it's like to be one of the brothers. You forget what it's like to be on the outside. But all favoritism will do is, is divide people and create hatred. Joseph's brothers couldn't even talk about him. That's how much it hurt. You know, and I, I, I see that. Like one of the ways you see the, the hatred that's created by favoritism is, is think about how you talk about those people to yourself or to, to other people. And when it's critiquing, when it's anger, when it's slander, there's hatred in our heart. And see, this, like, favoritism can be between our family members. It can, it can be between friends. It can be between different, like, whole groups of people. When one group has advantages and is, and, and is favorited and has uh, more opportunities, where another doesn't, there's a great divide. And all that, all that is birthed is brokenness, division, suffering, dysfunction. So what can we do about favoritism? I want you to listen to James 2, verses 1 through 9. It says this, My brothers and sisters, believers in our glorious Lord Jesus Christ, must not show favoritism. Suppose a man comes into your meeting wearing a gold ring and fine clothes, and a poor man in filthy old clothes also comes in. If you show special attention to the man wearing fine clothes and say, here's a good seat for you, but say to the poor man, you stand there or sit on the floor by my feet, have you not discriminated among yourselves and become judge with evil judges with evil thoughts? Listen, my dear brothers and sisters, has not God chosen those who are poor in the eyes of the world to be rich in faith and to inherit the kingdom he promised those who love him? But you have dishonored the poor. Is it not the rich who are exploiting you? 
Are they not the ones who are dragging you into court? Are they not the ones who are blaspheming the noble name of him to whom you belong? If you really keep the royal law found in Scripture, love your neighbor as yourself, you are doing right. But if you show favoritism, you sin and are convicted by the law as lawbreakers. James is clear. Showing favoritism is a sin. Now there's a lot of good teaching in this text. But let me focus just on these words. Love your neighbor as yourself. In doing so, you are doing what is right. But if you show favoritism, you sin. Where favoritism will always divide, love always unites. And so what can you do to deal with favoritism? I just... You can love. And let me show you some practical steps. If, uh, the first is this. If you favored someone, if you favor someone, or groups of people, or certain people, admit it. Like, be willing to open your eyes and just admit it. And maybe it is your kids. Maybe you have a favorite kid. You need to admit it. You need to admit it to God. Maybe you need to admit it to your spouse. You don't need to go on social media and post about it. But you need to go to the Lord and you need to to admit, God, you know, I see this, I I, I see this person in a different light and, and because of that, I treat them differently. And I know it's at the expense and at the hurt of others. Forgive me. And it's in that humility that, that you're taking the first step to freedom and healing. The second, if you're the favorite, if you've been favored, if you're part of a people that are favored, acknowledge it and renounce the self-pride that comes with it. Repent of the self-pride, all the things that we tell about ourselves because we're successful, we're good, we have a lot of friends, we have great relationships, you know, people like me, people love me, people listen to me, people follow me. When you find yourself being the favorite, in humility, renounce the pride. Humble yourself before the Lord and he will raise you up. The third is this. If you are not favored, if you're on the outside, and I know this is easier said than done, but choose to forgive so you can cut the chain of control that that mistreatment can have over you. You know, it's one thing for us to say that we're told to love our enemies. You know, Jesus told us to love our enemies. It's another thing when you, when you have an enemy. <laughs> you know, it's one thing to theoretically say, love your enemy or turn the other cheek. It's one thing to teach that in a Bible study. It, it's another when, when you actually have an enemy looking you in the face. When you have someone who's pained you, when there's someone who's hurt you, it's a whole lot harder when you move from theory to it being like lived out in your life. And it's really easy for me to say forgive those who have hurt you. But I know it's not that easy. I know it's a lot more difficult and complex than that. And yet, the truth is it's chains. It's chains. When, when we refuse to, to forgive uh, the ones who have, have favored others, included others, re- rejected us, like when we refuse uh, to, to forgive, it's just we, we're controlled by that mistreatment, by that pain, by that shame. And it's just chains that we walk through life with. But when we're able to forgive, I mean, 
we see the brother's response, and it's like, it, it, they end up wanting to kill their brother. They end up putting him in a pit, selling him off. And it doesn't justify their behavior, but, but man, like, you see what can happen in relationships. You see what can happen in families when, when there's favoritism. That bitterness, envy, jealousy, hatred can lead people to do really horrible things. And if the brothers would have been able to to forgive their father, you know, and maybe they did try to. I don't know. We don't know the whole story. I mean, did they ever confront Jacob? Like, did they ever go, Dad, like, do you know how much this hurts me? If they're Minnesotan, if they're like us Minnesotans, there ain't no way that they confronted their dad. We don't want to ruffle feathers. Are you afraid of, of, and, and it's a big problem. That, that the fear of approaching someone and confronting someone who's hurt us. Like that's just, that's just putting more chains on. Maybe they did and, and Jacob just didn't respond in the right way, but maybe they didn't. And maybe if they would have, and maybe if they would have forgiven their dad, maybe, maybe things would have happened differently. Favoritism is not love. It only divides. It always divides. And so often the envy and the resentment and the pain that we see in, in relationships with family and friends often traces back to undealt favoritism. And one of the saddest episodes in the New Old Testament is a byproduct of hatred that was fueled by favoritism. And yet... God still uses Jacob and his sons. And we can learn from their examples so that hopefully we would avoid the same mistakes. We would avoid the pain, the destruction, the division that favoritism brings. Let me pray. Lord Jesus, um, I pray that our eyes would be opened, God, to where we play favorites. God, I pray that um, we would learn to, to live and love and forgive, God, in the midst of rejection and pain. I, I, it's a miracle of your spirit, God, I think. Like, we need your spirit to help us love the people that have hurt us. We live in a world, God, of favorites. We, we live in, in a world where um, other where some are elevated and others are demoted. Let us not be guilty of showing special attention to the man who comes in dressed nice while we ignore the person in rags. Let us not be guilty of of showing affection and love to those who have a lot while ignoring the needs and the vulnerabilities and the weakness of those who have enough, who have little. I just pray, God, that um, you would root out this sin in our world, in our, in our country, in ourselves, in our church. Let us love you and love our neighbor. Let us live like you. Let us love like you. Let us forgive like you. We pray it all in Jesus' name. Amen.
love to the people all around us, people in our homes, the people that we live near, people in our city, the people in our community. Let that just be our prayer. Lord, teach us how to give their hands wide open, how to be more like you. And with that, we send you off with blessings. We look forward to seeing you guys next week.